Uh, welcome to the French House in London, Soho, a very important area for David Bowie. So just around the corner in the marquee, 90 Wardour Street, Bowie played there repeatedly in the 60s and also in 1973 with Mike Garson. Uh, and we're just over the road um, from uh, Good Earth Studios as well, where uh, Bowie made some of his great masterpieces uh, produced by Tony Visconti. But anyway, we're here because Clifford Slapper has written a comprehensive passionate and cerebral book about the great Mike Garson, one of the greatest pianists to work. It is cerebral, absolutely. There's some very big words in, in the book. I had to look some up. Um, about Mike Garson, one of, the, one of the, you know, the great musicians to work with David Bowie and, and to work in rock and pop and to make that transition over from jazz into um, pop and rock music. Um, so unfortunately, uh, Mike can't be with us today. Uh, he couldn't get over from Los Angeles, but he has prepared a message for everyone. Just a note before we start uh, Mike's video message, you can buy the book from the bar and then come round uh, to here where Clifford will be delighted to sign it for you. But anyway, over to Mike Garson's message. today, but uh, I'm busy here in California, and it's still a pleasure to be with you. Probably there shouldn't be a biography at this part of my life on me, because there's probably another volume sitting back there, but since Cliff got this wonderful uh, deal with the publishing company Phantom, I think, it's, uh, I think it's great that this is happening at this point in time. Cliff and I met several years back, as you know, he's a very good pianist, and he actually had worked with David Bowie on, uh, with Ricky Gervais on that commercial funny thing that happened years ago, I forget the name of it, but uh, he came to the States and we hit it off, and he just uh, got the urge after we spoke, and so did I, to do a, a, a biography on my life, and we spent about 25 hours where he interviewed me, and then subsequently uh, probably another 200 hours, aside from the 30 or 40 people he interviewed and all the other information that he gathered. So, uh, probably be a very boring book for a lot of people. It has no gossip in it. And you have to get that into some other books. So I'm purposely withholding any dirt that I have from those periods in the 70s. And uh, you're just going to get all about the music and the art and pretty much the creative process. So I'm sorry about that. I know people like a little about that, but that's not where I live. I'm really hoping this is an inspiration to future artists and creators uh, that come about over the next several hundred years, because I think you can actually have a balanced life, uh, do your music and have a family, etc., etc., and you don't have to be insane and crazy and dramatizing all kinds of things to do um, music. So um, those are some of my thoughts there. Um, I don't think I have much to say other than I think I should play um, live for you. I've been working on a little arrangement of Space Oddity. I always change it around because that's not a tune that I recorded on the original version, but I, um, I recorded it on a solo album of the Bowie Variations, but I'm still searching and finding new things on that piece. So I'm going to use that famous lick uh, that goes up. Uh, I'm going to use that as kind of a, let's say, a motif to develop and fool around with. But you'll see how it develops. I, I mean, I don't even know because it, I play it differently each time. I was working on something the other day, but it had a different energy. So we'll see where it goes today. 
And I really want to thank you for coming to the event. Um, I hope you do enjoy the book. And just let me know when, you know, write me on Facebook or whatever. And I want to thank Cliff. This guy was working 16 hours a day the last six months. I could not believe it. So I think you're really going to get an honest book and uh, enjoy it. Awesome. Fantastic. Cliff, so it's one thing to be a fan and one thing to be influenced by, but what, what made you want to spend... <laughs> I think that answers the question. <laughs> what, what made you want to spend 16 hours a day for six months and more? Well, to be honest, um, Tom... I've, I've been in a bit of a, a dream with this project uh, over the past however long because um, it, for me it is it is the it's been the dream project because when I was uh, ten years old 
I, I totally fell, fell in love with the music of this guy. Got the chance to meet him a few years ago, spend some time with him. That was about six years ago. And um, we found we had certain things in common um, of different kinds. And we, we definitely did hit it off. And I honestly asked him, I, I knew that there were dozens of biographies of David Bowie, with whom Mike has worked hundreds of times. But as far as I was aware, I'd never seen a book about this exceptional man. And after we'd been chatting for a few hours on our first meeting, I just literally threw it at him and said, I don't think I've seen any, are there any biographies of, of your life? Because it's an extraordinary life, in fact. And um, quick as a shot, he just said, no, there's not a single one, but I think you'd be the perfect person to write it. And I thought, what have I got myself into here? And so that was it. So literally within a few hours of our first meeting, we both agreed that that's what would happen. And um, that was, as I say, six years ago. It's been, a, it's been a long process, but a very joyful one, because it's been a wonderful learning curve, I think, for both of us. And I think Mike has said to me that he feels kind of quite grateful for the process, because, it, because it's invited him into a whole lot of introspection and retrospection that he might not otherwise have engaged in. If it, it, it strikes me reading the book that the insight that you bring to it being a pianist um, has added a lot to the book and the understanding of the musicality and creative process. Do you think that's the case? Uh, I would hope so. I mean, when Mike said you'd be the perfect person to write this, I think the reason was that we'd already been chatting for an hour or two and sort of comparing notes what it is to be a working pianist. And um, it may be interesting for some to reflect that although Mike has done an awful lot of very high profile work, as we all know, not just with Bowie incidentally, but also with a lot of other big names like um, the Nine Inch Nails, Smashing Pumpkins, uh, Gwen Stefani, um, obviously Luther Vandross, Lulu, uh, all kinds of uh, very diverse people that he's toured and played with over the years. Um, but a lot of musicians, what, what the thing we got into discussing at an early stage was sort of the life of a musician, what that means in um, the current culture that we inhabit, and how that works, and the fact that unless you are actually the, the sort of um, the lead artist, as it were, on the bill, if you're actually your, your expertise is to a company, then however much the high profile gigs that you're doing, you will find that you do some rather less high profile gigs and we found a lot of humour in that together and he shared a lot of funny stories, many of which are in this book, um, about the coming up and down with that. Like he remembers for example playing at Madison Square Garden with David Bowie and being asked what pianos he needed and wanted and okay so you have a, a black grand piano this night but tomorrow night I'd like to have a white grand piano and they said absolutely let's just move in and he said you know like three days later he was back at home with his wife and she was telling him why the hell hadn't he put out the garbage and you know and, and, and also playing much well just much smaller gigs which has to be done you know to, to, to sort of pay the rent for any working musician so we got into a lot of interesting discussions and also a lot more philosophical discussions about the creative process but in answer, Tom, I would say that I, I certainly hope, and I think you'll find that, I mean, it, the book takes shape as a dialogue, in fact, between two musicians, between two pianists, and I think that did help a lot. And many of us who are fans um, know Mike's work very well, but we're not necessarily familiar with him as a character, and you, you've certainly brought out aspects of his character that he's an engaging and, and in some ways eccentric person. Was it your aim to really bring out that flavour of him in the book? Um, absolutely. Again, what I'm hoping to achieve with this book is basically to introduce this individual to more of a public than have met him before. Uh, for several reasons and on several levels. You know, his, his professional acumen, his, his professionalism is beyond compare. And um, he's, over the years, always been something of a mentor to all kinds of people. He's got a strong educator kind of streak in him. Uh, there are a lot of dimensions to this man, and I genuinely became fascinated with him and want to, to, to share that with other people. As far as, yeah, very eccentric, very funny, and I was only sorry that this isn't, at least not yet, one of those audio books, because he's got a very strong, um, unreconstructed Brooklyn accent, and a lot of the long quotations from him, which you'll find in the book, really need to be heard with that, that in mind, because it makes it a lot funnier. Uh, musical categorization is a difficult issue, with purists often having distaste for other genres. With Mike having moved from jazz into pop rock and classical music, even electronic music, with some of the work he's done with David Bowie, um, uh, do you think that's caused him uh, problems in terms of his perception from other musicians within the industry? That's a very good question, and, and, and the short answer is absolutely yes. Um, again, one of the main themes in the book is that of um, 
the problem of categorization uh, being put into boxes as a negative thing, you know. And uh, very early on in our conversations, this, is, this came out as one of Mike's main concerns in life. Um, for obvious practical reasons, he's always been hard to categorize. He has in, he suffered snobbery and prejudice on all sides because of this. So, and there are lots of practical examples of this, and, and many that I felt I could share as well with him. Um, the jazz establishment, for example, the, the jazz clique, if I can use that word, is, is ironically one of the most purest and snobbiest of all, uh, which is ironic because, of course, jazz, in a sense, is meant to be something alternative in, in some way. Um, but once you get into the hardcore of, of jazz purism, there's, there's a whole sort of pecking order. And Mike has totally been aware of that. Um, he had originally a classical background. He's actually um, created several thousand classical compositions, absolutely prolific. Um, he had a strong background in jazz. He actually mastered the art of jazz almost perversely because he felt, as I did at times, that people are, were saying, you, you're not quite a jazz person. And he made it his job throughout his teens to prove them wrong. He became a jazz master. And then he got that all-important call from Tony DeFries in 1972, without which, who knows? But that actually, that call from David Bowie's manager propelled him into the world of rock music, which he's never left since then either. So he straddles all of these genres uh, and, and none. And uh, that's a very key theme in the book. You eloquently describe in the book how Garson and Bowie started to work together and how their artistic collaboration flourished. But what is it in essence that you think Mike Garson brought to Bowie in those early years, 72 to 75? Well, I think a lot of the credit for um, Mike's presence on those, those early, those key Bowie albums of the early 70s has to come back to David Bowie himself, and Mike would be the first person to acknowledge this. There's clearly something of the artistic genius at work, because if you actually study all of the choices that Bowie has made, some of them controversial, and some of them certainly unpopular for obvious reasons with the musicians that he's cast aside. But the fact remains that he has actually been true to himself, and all of the choices he's made have been primarily, I would argue, artistic ones. Uh, Mike wasn't um, used by David Bowie, as it were, on, on stage or on record for quite a long period throughout the 80s, uh, the late 70s and throughout the 80s. And he says that he, he was quite confident that if that call came at some point, he'd be ready to, to, to step back into place. That's exactly what happened. If the call hadn't have come, he'd have been okay with that as well. And apparently there's a, something of a rapport between Bowie and Garson, which I've, I've heard a lot about. Um, which is that they, they both uh, believe that the, the art, the creativity, the music is absolutely foremost. And any other arguments or quibbles, which, which clearly exist, are always um, uh, put to one side. And there were communications from David Bowie to Mike Garson during the preparation of this book, which I, I'm not at liberty to go into in detail or to have quoted because they're of a private and personal um, category. But suffice to say that I can, I can vouch for the fact quite definitely that there's a very genuine bond of friendship and mutual respect between those two men, which is founded on the, the primacy of the creative process above all else. Cliff, do you think you might be able to demonstrate something about the way that Mike Carson plays and what he brought to David Bowie and perhaps play us a song or two? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to do that. I'll put this down. Um, <laughs> well, what, what it, this, this is not at all staged, is it? <laughs> Me, play the piano? Oh, okay. Uh, well, you know you want to. There's a piano down here, I, I just... Uh, uh, when I first met Mike, um, I told him that, about my background in loving the music of David Bowie, particularly the records with him playing on them from when I was 10 years old. And, we had a good chat about all of this, and he said, well, show me what you do. And I was sat in his studio there in California, and I was very nervous, because to play, he said, well, play something like Lady Grinning Soul, and to play that to the man who created that piano part, for the first time, cold, and um, I did this in a similar gathering once before, and I, I'll make the same point now, that there's, um, my nervousness about doing this now is, is not quite as great, but it's halfway there, so it's kind of, you're actually getting the dramatic effect of seeing somebody before your eyes who's actually nervous about what they're about to do. But no, Mike sat really close and stared at my fingers. Come on, play Lady Grinning Soul. Uh, and I, I did, and, and uh, I kind of got the thumbs up, which I, I'm still smiling about six, six years later.
actually, um, when, I, when I played that to Mike, um, he gave me the thumbs up, uh, which was very, very uh, gratifying because I was shaking like a leaf. And, um, but he actually paid me a nice compliment because he said, what you've done there is, is actually better because it's harder because he said, you're, you're playing the top line because I don't sing. So like, I'm playing the melody line, which normally would be sung by David Bowie, as well as playing the piano part. So he said, you've got two there for the price of one, so well done. <laughs> the other thing I'll just throw in, just for thank you, thanks. The other thing I'll throw in here for fun, just uh, to, to switch the thing around, is Mike's audition piece, um, with a nice little story, and of course it's all covered in the book, which is that um, when he got that call in 1972 out of the blue, he was a struggling jazz musician, smoky jazz bars of New York, earning almost nothing and telling his family at home that he couldn't go on like this. He was not, not making ends meet. And then he got this call out of the blue from Tony DeFries, literally saying, we want you to, David Bowie is coming to America from England on the Ziggy Stardust tour. And we, we, we're looking for something. We need you to come and join us on the piano. And Mike's first response was, David who? Because he hadn't, literally hadn't heard of him. And uh, he was uh, teaching a lesson at the time. And he didn't know what to do. They said, you've got to be at the studio in Manhattan in 20 minutes for the audition. Otherwise, you know, it's too late. So he left his piano student um, to babysit uh, for his one-year-old baby who was there at the time, which he says, you know, his wife still has trouble forgiving him for. And uh, ran off to the audition. When he got there, he found these uh, spiders from Mars, which again, he didn't know what to make of it all because he really wasn't from that world at all. And uh, apparently Mick Ronson handed him a little scrap of paper with a few chords scribbled on it and said to him, uh, it's one of our songs, can you do that for us? And it was actually this chord sequence. Just to finish off the story, um, he, got, he didn't get as far as that. He literally only got through the first few bars. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, as he recalls it, Mick Ronson just straight away said, that's it, you're in. And, um, and he, because he had this, he had what, he, what they wanted, this amazing, this, this, this sort of jazz approach. The original, which he had never heard even, was, although it was out, had been done, of course, by, by Rick Waitman. Uh, it was also, is also a fantastic pianist, but of a very different kind. It was much more of a, a straight pop approach in those days. A lot of our perceptions of how changes is, I think, now comes from a lot of fantastic live versions, like on David Live, which are very jazzy. If you actually go back to the original, it's not really jazzy like that. And Mike just threw that in that day, and they're like, that, that was it. That was his audition piece. Thanks. So Garson was a, a constant in an ever-changing band from 72 to 75. A lot of other people were hired and fired in that time. How do you think, uh, why do you think that Bowie stuck with him? Was it mostly musical reasons or was it partly a reflection on his character? I, th I think it, it has to be creative reasons that Bowie stuck with him for that period and again came back to him later. Um, by Mike's own admission, you know, there, there, there could have been reasons, non-artistic reasons, not to stick with him. You know, there were issues which had been well documented going on at that time. There were tensions, there were problems. The fact is, as you say, Mike actually lasted through that period really more. If you take the whole period from 72 right into the late 80s, again, Mike has the, that little span, which was probably the longest. And I um, would say the reason for that, it comes back to what I mentioned a few minutes ago. There was, and actually still is, um, quite a subtle understanding between those two men. They, they are both 
uh, if I may use, coin a phrase, they're both quite cerebral, actually, to coin a popular word. In, and they, thank you, thank you very much, and yourself. And, <laughs> uh, they, they, I think Bowie and Garson in particular have, have always operated on, the, on, on, a, on a, a very high plane. I mean, this, there's a value judgment here, and not everyone has to agree with this, but I mean, that's how I'm looking at it. And um, I also think Mike just sort of did his job. He was brought on, on board. Uh, to add some colour to the palette which Bowie in his genius was constantly putting together as a sort of uh, master stage manager and still does to this day and he wanted something avant-garde you know, something different, it sounds almost cliched now but if you think back to the rock scene or the pop scene in 1970, Britain or America the idea of throwing in that jazz piano element in the way that it was done uh, that was a stroke of genius that was Bowie's genius in fact, he knew exactly what he wanted and when Mike Garson did that unbelievable solo on the title track of Aladdin Sane, he describes for us in the book here about exactly how that really happened, because it's been described many times, but not always accurately, you know, and he actually was trying to do the solo that Bowie, he thought Bowie would want, so Bowie said, you've got to do a, a great solo here, and he started by doing some blues, then he tried, and Bowie said, no, no, we don't want that, and then he tried to do Latin, just straight Latin, no, we don't want that. And as Mike remembers it, Bowie then said to him, look, just do that thing that you do, you know, that mad avant-garde thing. And Mike remembers saying to him, are you sure? Because you're not going to be selling any of these albums if I do. Because Mike's attitude was that he was thinking back to how these audiences of like four or five people that you would play in a really obscure uh, New York jazz bar in 1969. It was, it was tough, as it is now. Jazz gigs can be very, very tiny. And this was, he, he didn't bargain on the catalyst, the, the fact that Bowie had, the, I think, the foresight to realise that when you combine these things, it's magic, absolute magic. Do you think some of the guitarists that Bowie used from 76 through to the 90s, he was looking for that same edge that he had with Mike Garson before. So if you think of Adrian Ballou or Robert Fripp or Reeves Gavrells, that, that, that it was that element, he, that magic he was looking for. That's a really good point. I think all three of them in different ways. Um, and, but for me, I would say the one that kind of came closest, um, and I've done a long interview with him, in fact, for this book, is Riggs Gabrels. The son, his, his attitude, uh, and it's no coincidence that him and Mike remain seriously good friends to this day. That, a jazz fan, right. And they have the same approach. And um, there's a kind of, uh, the fact that Reeves Gabrels is pretty much the only person to have actually elected to, to move on, to actually tell David Bowie that I don't, I'm not going to be around for the next tour, that takes some guts, it's not, you know, more likely to be the other way around. But the fact that Reeves Gabrels is the only person ever to have done that is part of his sort of character, his, his um, what's the word I'm looking for, Tom? Because uh, I was going to say, ca I was, I was going to say cantankerous, but that's way too negative. Yes, integrity, but also just a little bit difficult. Counterculture, and just a little bit difficult. Not quite cantankerous, but just he and Mike are just a little bit difficult, but in quite a nice way. So that Mike can be a producer's nightmare, apparently, and you know he knows this and they know this. Simple reason why Mike is a producer's nightmare is that he cannot or will not play the same thing twice in the same way, which any professional musician, I see there are several of them here right now, knows is, is not quite the way the game is meant to be played. Now, if you're sort of in a recording studio or rehearsal studio, it's not really the dumb thing to say, no, no, I've done it once that way, I'm not going to repeat that again, I might do it different this time. But that is what Mike Garson has done for the past 40 years, and incredibly, he's, he's got away with it. You know, people like Tony Visconti, who again uh, uh, did a great interview for me uh, uh, for this book, he says, he says, Mike's an absolute nightmare, but you've got to love him. You've just got to love him because of the, he pulls it off, he just gets away with it. He's, he says, I don't know if he actually can't, but he certainly won't play the same thing twice in the same way. And that's part of his life philosophy because he's very committed to living in the moment. So it's almost this Buddhist thing that um, if you're really living in the moment and you're creating with each moment, then it is going to be a bit tough if some producer tells you you've got to do it exactly like the way you did half an hour ago. He's on tour in June, apparently. Tony was gone to. Sorry. Where, where would that be? Uh, uh, Shepherd's Bush Empire, the 30th of June, I, I, I seem to recall. Um, but I thought, I thought the way you described Jerry Leonard's anecdote, Jerry Leonard was Bowie's uh, musical director for some years, in recent years. His anecdote about saying to Mike Garson, you just can't improvise over a whole set of David Bowie songs. And Mike, you know, begrudgingly accepting it, but he did do, didn't he? Yeah, he accepted it and then he did, and then he did it anyway, that's right. Um, 
And there's a, there's a lovely quote, I think we've used it as one of the chapter headings, an old quote from, uh, from Tony Visconti about might, and I don't know if I can get this quite right, we've got it here somewhere, but actually, we'll look at, look at it in a minute, but he basically says, the great thing about might is he looks at you with those, with those deep green eyes, nods his head, says he's listening to all of your d directions, and then goes away and does what the fuck he wants. <laughs> that was Tony's summation of working with Mike. Um, of all the other artists that Garson's worked with in the pop and rock sphere, who, who do you think he's done the best work with? So Nine Inch Nails, um, Gwen Stefani, various others. Um, I, I can answer that without hesitation. This is a bit of a personal thing. I mean, he, he has, as I say, he's worked with a really um, diverse range of artists. When I, when I came to write this list as a preface to the book, I didn't really know where to start or where to finish. I mean, you know, there's jazz people like Freddie Hubbard, uh, uh, Stan Getz, I mean, jazz fusion. Um, and there was, uh, he worked at one point with Martha Rees, Martha and the Vandellas, obviously Luther Vandross when he was running the Garson Band in the, in the 70s through Bowie, you know, um, as I say, did a tour with Lulu, of all things. And, um, and then in later years, a whole succession, the Dillinger Escape Plan, the Polyphonic Spree, you know, some quite interesting angles. But for me, um, I've got to say, St. Vincent, uh, which is Annie, Annie Clark, uh, St. Vincent, fantastic band, and in the last few years, you know, do, doing well, getting better known than ever before. And uh, Mike did an album with her uh, in 2007, and this is a very personal thing, but I would ask you all to go and listen to it, or I might play it later tonight, uh, which is called All My Stars Aligned by St. Vincent, in which Mike's piano is, is have very heavily featured. And that, for my money, is uh, as good, if not better, than men, most of the things we really are supposed to know him for. So check out St. Vincent, All My Stars Aligned. What about Mike's later work with Bowie, when he came back from uh, the Buddha Suburbia album onwards? Are there any particular highlights you'd identify there? Um, again, there are. There are, there, are, there are some wonderful moments um, on, on albums like Earthling, um, uh, later on with Reality, of course, and... Um, uh, oh, we've got, a, we've got a great breakdown, track by track, of all the latest stuff as well in the appendix to the book, in which I actually drove Mike crazy for, for, for several weeks you know, night and day this summer. And uh, the reason, you could see when he said on that film, very kindly of me, that, you know, uh, Cliff worked so hard, he was doing 16 hours a day. If you look really closely, he's actually slightly groaning inwardly because I was on the phone to him most of that time, <laughs> driving him mad. It's like, this boat can really go. Oh, I need to go and have a rest cure, you know. But, but the, what I was doing partly in that time was I was actually, um, with, with his absolute agreement and consent, obviously, getting him to break down all of the tracks he's ever played on with Bowie and, and make at least one comment on, on all of them and tell us what he remembers of it and what it was like. And uh, he, 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 what, with a few uh, prompts to his memory, he started, started to warm up to it. And, and I think he really got into it and we both loved that, really enjoyed that process. But as for tracks in later years, well, I would say there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a piece called The Motel. Um, and, um, sorry? On Outside. On outside. Um, um, Battle for Britain, uh, the letter, and um, and of course, and of course, uh, bring me the bring me the the disco king, which is a, again a great story about about how this was sort of rehashed, kept surfacing over several albums. Would it or wouldn't it be used? And so it was quite a suspense over over many years when it was finally was used. And that story makes interesting reading. Cliff, one more question, then we'll go to the audience. How would you sum up Mike Garson's musical legacy? What Mike has brought into the musical arena for me, or really reinforced, is the idea of improvisation. Um, I said a minute ago, he's, he's, he's thinking in the moment, he's living in the moment. If the moment passes, you just won't get him. He's, he's lost interest. He, he really does practice what he preaches. And that shows in his music, because... Um, or occasionally he has obviously had to go to the score and he has to accept the rigours and the disciplines of Tory to some degree. But even then, I think he was the only musician over the years that Bowie, for example, has given that much leeway to, really. There's nobody who's given quite as much leeway as Mike, who's been told effectively by Bowie, you're going to do your thing, you know, within certain limits. And um, what the legacy that Mike has brought is the importance of, firstly, always creating in the moment 
Forget everything else you've done or everything you're going to do. There is only now. There is only this moment. And that's you're going to try to create sound which reflects that and is honest to your feelings, honest to your emotions. He's very, very hot on that. And I've learned a lot from him about that. And that's what I know he wants to pass on uh, to other people. And then the second thing, a uh, corollary of that, I suppose, is not to accept the artificial musical boundaries which are erected for us. Like, are you classical? Are you opera? Are you jazz? Are you rock? It's absolute nonsense. Of course, you know, there are... You can describe some music as being leaning a certain way, but in the end of the day, we all know music is music, and it's, it's, it's there for us to create and express to each other our emotions. And you might use certain genres to do that, but um, it's just wrong that if somebody's expressing in a rock genre and then slides into a jazzy form, that they, people often frown on these things. You know, we've got to have much more freedom and fluidity in music and in the arts generally. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for Cliff? Uh, the most satisfying part was the beginning and the end because it forms a circular journey because actually um, I start with an intro about myself as a 10 year old listening to Aladdin Sane and not dreaming that I'd get to meet these people and, and write this book um, and then it moves on to how that, that happened and then we get stuck into Mike's life and then the book ends um, not wishing to, you know, spoiler alert but <laughs> the book ends with me coming back from LA having uh, done an awful lot of interviews with Mike and these other people, and um, and actually returning full circle. And um, there's a very, very queer thing that happened, one of those odd little coincidences at the very end of the book, which is all quite genuine, um, which kind of made, really did bring it full circle.